Great. Welcome, everyone, to Raven Pack's fourth annual research conference. The event is titled Reshaping Finance with Alternative Data. This is uh, one of the most exciting events that we've ever hosted. Uh, we were blessed to have some great speakers form part of today's event. Uh, at the same time, our friends and co-sponsors, uh, Estimize, Deltix, uh, and Return Path were great to help us put together this uh, extraordinary event where we hope to bring uh, forth some new and exciting research in a fairly hot space uh, around new uh, data sets influencing the investment process. Uh, so I'm quite excited to, to introduce uh, this event and I hope you guys enjoy it. Uh, we at Raven Pack are quite uh, involved in the area of alternative data. We have been pioneers in news and social media analytics for over 10 years now and have developed quite an extensive customer base in quantitative finance. So we've learned a lot over the years and we've uh, tried to bring some of those insights to today's conference. So just to give you a sense of who's in the room today, uh, there's only about 6% of you that are in the financial technology side, selling data, selling services. Uh, we have about 7% of the audience comprised of uh, sell side participants. But more interestingly, 87% of our audience is actually from the buy side. So it's uh, effectively an event really geared towards the buy side and we're hoping to address a pretty interesting question. You know, does alternative data actually add alpha? Right? So that will be the key sort of question that we'll, we'll address throughout the event. And my objective now is just to give you a quick introduction um, that will set the stage for what I believe um, our, our colleagues will do a better job at bringing forth how people are using alternative data, how it could add value, what are some of the challenges. Um, so the, the first, first thing to say is there is effectively a, a number of individuals today that prepared some real research reports. So there's already some research behind alternative data that should bring this to life for you. Um, when you Think about the first session, uh, you'll, you'll get a great set of insights from uh, Yin Lao, who's the global head of quantitative strategy at Deutsche Bank, and he's gonna be talking to us about machine learning, specifically about news analytics and stock selection. Uh, we will then be followed by Ned Smith, who's an associate professor at Northwestern, and he's bringing forth some interesting ideas around networks and incorporating news into, into price models. Um, our very own Peter Hoffes, who's the chief data scientist at Ravenpact, uh, will bring uh, forth some very interesting insights on exploiting alternative data in, in the investment process, uh, research that hasn't been published yet, so it's a good sneak peek as to what's to come. Uh, we'll then take a break and have a, a lunch uh, that will be hosted right outside this room. Uh, the afternoon session will start off with a panel on artificial intelligence, where we will talk about whether it's actually delivering on its promise, is it really delivering what it was meant to do. And we've got uh, a great moderator, Garrett Nenner, that will talk about uh, some of these, uh, these challenges and ultimately its opportunities. The speakers uh, are also quite exciting. Um, we also have Gordon Ritter afterwards from GSA Capital that will present uh, his model on new sentiment and stock selection. And uh, our friends from Return Path are gonna give you just a quick uh, presentation on a very interesting uh, alternative data set. Um, that relates to purchasing data, transactional data. Uh, so I think that, that's gonna be quite, quite interesting to see. We'll take a little break, um, and then move on to the afternoon session where Michael Beal, the CEO of a, a new, very interesting quantitative hedge fund, Data Capital Management, will talk about the future of investing in the data economy. And uh, our friends from JP Morgan will be presenting uh, a, a pretty interesting model on predictive analytics, uh, and we'll finalize the event with a panel on alternative data um, I'll be your moderator for that uh, panel, and we have some, some great speakers. Matt Ober, uh, co-head uh, of, of data strategy at Wolquan, will be speaking. We've got Lee Drogan, the CEO of Estimize, Eric Weinberg from Return Path, and our keynote speaker, Yin Lau. Um, finally, we'll end after all of this information you're probably overloaded with, uh, with a nice cocktail reception where you'll probably forget everything that you learned today. And uh, we hope to, to ha have you join us afterwards. Uh, at the same time, uh, we are sort of really keen to network with you and, and know more about you, what you guys are doing. So let me get started. Um, the, the bottom line is, is there a capability within alternative data that can help investors find alpha? And what we're trying to do at Raven Pack is essentially getting people ahead of the pack 
um, by mining new and unique data sets. Um, when we think about how did we get here, one of the, one of the questions are, I'm always asking is, well, did we really become data hoarders, right? Have we simply amassed data that we really don't need? Uh, and is this the reason why we now have alternative data? Well, I think the answer is yes. I mean, we, we've, we've all become data hoarders, right? There's, if you think about yourselves, you have your phones full of pictures that you probably don't really need. You may, maybe took five or six pictures of the same thing, and it just keeps accumulating. You have emails and documents that you're just, you're just afraid of losing and deleting, so it just keeps amassing. Well, it's the same exact problem in organizations, right? The big data craze has inspired uh, firms to basically save everything, right? And I think it's a misconception that the more data you have, the better it is. We don't realize that gathering so much information creates a real challenge when it comes to trying to make sense of it in the future. Um, so there's a real problem, and for financial firms particularly, the issue is that they have to keep a lot of this data for compliance purposes. Or the fact that they don't know whether it's useful or not forces them to keep it. So we have so much data in our environments, whether it's the cloud or internal servers, that it's becoming really challenging to make sense of it. Um, and as I said, it's not the fact that you have data or that you have a variety of data that makes it any good. Um, it's, it's really about your ability to analyze it and to manage it. And so when we think about our, our data hoarding um, uh, sins, if you may, uh, we're hoping that in the future they will bear some fruit and it'll help us, particularly in the investment process, that we will come up with ways to analyze it and make sense of it so that we can generate some insights. So there still could be something good coming out of this. Um, and the reality is that it's led to a new wave of data sources. Uh, there's data coming from social networks, from mobile devices. There's lots of data coming from the Internet of Things, from low-cost sensors all, over, all, all around the world. Um, and this explosion of, of data um, is creating some interesting opportunities. Um, when you think about the uh, accumulation of this data um, in itself as a big data solution, it really promises to create new ways of harvesting signals for investors. And the more important thing is that a lot of this information is new, right? So it goes against the tradition. We've been accustomed to building models based on market data and fundamentals, and now we're getting insights into fundamentals through alternative sources. So there's definitely a way for many of you to get ahead of the pack uh, looking at these new, new sources of, of data. Um, and again, these data sets range from anything from point of sale data to satellite imagery, so there's a, a wide variety of information that you can use. Um, let's talk about some of these data sets. Uh, so one of the, the first categories would be news and social media. This is probably the more mature of the alternative data sets. It's been around for a while. More specifically, machine-readable news uh, and machine-readable social media has made its way into the quantitative process. And there's great opportunities there to mine for signals. Um, credit card transactions is a new and up-and-coming trend that I'm seeing. Lots of demand from firms wanting to get anonymized aggregate transaction data to capture trends in consumer purchasing habits. Uh, and there are you know, some interesting challenges there, but it, nonetheless, it's a very promising data set. Uh, satellite data, being able to look at images uh, from orbiting satellites that can give us a sense of what people are doing or the health of crops based on their color or how many people are purchasing at Walmart or a retail store as a result of counting the number of cars in a parking lot. So there's plenty of ways that we can use satellite imagery and it's becoming faster and more available to us. So that means that if we have the technology to transform that into data, structured data, then we can bring it into a model. The Internet of Things is also extremely promising. It's really a collection of data generated from smart grids, from smart cities, smart homes. There's data from shipping, from transportation that is amassing in the billions of data points. And it's a great way to immediately or in more of a, of a real-time fashion measure the supply and demand of resources or services. So it's another good way of being able to predict, for example, what a company's earnings will be or, or revenue will be as a result of activity taking place in real time without having to wait until the company releases the information. Um, when it comes to crowdsource data, we're seeing a lot of social networks specialized social networks appearing where they're looking to gather opinions from large crowds, um, aiming for some signal as a result of the wisdom of the crowds. 
Uh, and this is quite interesting when you think about estimates and when you think about ratings. Uh, plenty of networks evolving where we can start to mine insights from them. Uh, there's also location and foot traffic data. There are companies gathering movements of people as a result of their, iPhone, their phones. So you know where they're going. You're also uh, getting check-ins from people, where they are. I'm currently at Starbucks, or I'm at this restaurant, or I'm at the Westin. Uh, you're able to effectively use your mobile devices to alert of your location. And as a result, you can aggregate this data and make sense of where people are and what they're doing. Um, we also have uh, people gathering local prices in remote areas, and for example, in Africa, where it's more difficult to get data from crops or data for a specific service, retail service. There are people using tools and their phones effectively to send prices by taking pictures. So we can aggregate all that information and, and get a, a measurement of prices in areas where it's difficult to normally get it. Uh, peer lending data. People borrowing, people lending, transactions across the board. Uh, so it's a more timely way of measuring supply of capital or even over indebtedness. Um, and app data has great potential. Just so many apps in your phones doing so many different things. If we're able to collect a lot of that data, we're able to generate some interesting factors from that. Uh, and people are interacting with their devices all the time. So this is just another amazing source to start looking into and trying to mine for insights. Uh, weather data finally has another uh, uh, category is, is quite interesting. It's been around for a while, but there are more sensors being placed internally within cities that are more effective at measuring, you know, what is, what is the weather really like in Manhattan or on 45th Street? Um, how does it really feel to be in a specific city as opposed to these general weather forecasts, which don't tend to be very um, effective? There are also sensors that are being placed inside buildings, so you can get internal weather. Um, which again will help you maybe predict how people feel really as opposed to what you think they're feeling as a result of general weather forecasts. So there's many ways of looking at all these data sets and again the challenges are, are great but we'll, we'll start looking at, at some of them in a second. Right? Um, so I, I like to think of the challenges in, in three dimensions. Um, one of them is value, right? Is it, is it valuable to you as an investor? Is it even relevant? You know, can you actually use it as part of your mandate or your investment process? And then finally, does the data actually have the capacity to be used in the investment process? How much can you actually trade on the information? So the, the first thing on value, uh, one of the things that we are seeing is that many of these data sets are so new that there's practically no research behind them. So there's, or there's very little information or very little academic or, or professional research done on these data sets. So we don't really know that they work. We believe that they work, but we don't really know. Right? Um, the other challenge is that a lot of these data sets um, track products and services. And uh, the information itself is not mapped to tradable securities. So you need to do a lot of work to connect the data. People walking on the streets, people buying a certain product, all that needs to be connected to the companies that own those products or the, or the subsidiaries of a company that is traded. So there's effectively an investment to be made in mapping this alternative data to something that you can trade. Um, a lot of this information is unstructured, uh, so it means that you need technologies like natural language processing when it comes to text, or you need special image processing when it comes to pictures or video. Uh, and it's not very easy to just extract insights. You need to apply layers of intelligence and AI to make sense of it, simply to structure it. And then, of course, you need to look to see if it adds value to your investment process. Uh, another challenge is the history of these data sets. We only, although we, we've started to hoard data now, uh, it's only recently that we figured this could be valuable for investing. So we don't have very deep historical archives on these data sets. And in many cases, they're as young as one or two years. Others are months old. And that's not enough to do proper backtesting. The challenge, of course, is we need to wait. And we need to wait until it accumulates in a way that is uh, testable. Uh, and we need to look for other sources that perhaps have amassed more of a historical archive so we can do more backtesting. Back uh, the other challenge that we see is the content integrity in these data sets. Uh, because providers of the data weren't contemplating selling it, there are some gaps and there are some format issues across the different data sets. And you need to normalize all the different formats. You need to figure out a way to put it into a format that is useful to you. We also find that they're niche. Right? They are covering a very limited uh, number of stocks. Um, Twitter was a great example where 
most of the stocks they cover are those that people talk about on Twitter. So there, you can't easily create sizable portfolios as a result of probing Twitter. Uh, when it comes to other data sets, they're even more niche than that. They're either retail focused or healthcare focused, uh, tech focused. So you need to think that and take that into consideration whether it in fact applies to your uh, investment mandate. Um, value erosion is another interesting uh, challenge. Uh, the more users you have on these niche data sets, the more likely the value will be arbitraged away. So we need to look for better ways of connecting all these different data sets to make sense of them and try to be clever and by connecting and using more sophisticated analysis to exploit it in ways where our competitors are not. Right? But there's always people that will go for the low-hanging fruit and it's very likely that the value of these data sets will erode quite quickly. So it's not all challenges, right? There are many opportunities with alternative data. Um, I like to think of it as an opportunity for us to innovate in finance. It's a way of developing differentiated portfolios. It's a way of improving the scalability of our strategies. It provides ways to avoid crowded trades. So great opportunities to innovate today with the technology we have, with the data we have, a, a way to explain things that we can't at present with the market data and the fundamental data that we're exposed to. Uh, another way of measuring new and interesting estimates. Uh, a way of creating a factor that you don't necessarily have. Uh, it's another interesting way of connecting the dots, right? connecting different points by not just looking at market data, but looking at what people are saying about an event. What people are saying about a competitor, what people are saying about a supplier. So it's an, a great opportunity to understand the, the effects of the contagion effects of information across an entire network of, of tradable securities. Um, and as I said, the supply chain contagion is interesting or the competitive contagion is interesting. Um, and finally, the ability to predict, right? Can you use this information to predict more accurately than you do today? And I think that's where the real value comes from. That's where we, where we would all like it to be. Um, so I'll, I'll end there, and uh, I'm going to turn to our, our next speaker.